But we're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through the website. That way they get logged and I get an email notification and I get a little thing on my WordPress that spins at the top and they don't get missed. I'm still not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else either. It is the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's time for another AMA. Tonight, we're going to be fielding questions from the lobby, our chat room here on Twitch. All right. One thing I'd like to start doing with these AMAs, just to try to um, uh, make the shows a bit more focused so that we're not talking about 20 different things in one episode. And honestly, to make them easier to promote. So one of the things we do with each of these episodes, we convert them into a YouTube video. And it's really hard in a whatever 150 character YouTube title to talk about 18 different things we talked about in an AMA. So we're going to try to stick to a smaller handful of questions and spend a bit more time on each of them. Now that might involve like looking some stuff up on Google or actually taking the time to look up stuff on Board Game Geek. And I think that's going to be worth it so that we can actually deep dive the questions a little better and give you better quality content instead of just throwing out an answer to something quickly. Now, I'm not saying you can't ask anything. It is an AMA. I'm not saying we're going to throw stuff out. Maybe we'll fire off some quick questions that we won't SEO, right? But we're looking for, you know, three really good topics we can cover for tonight. All right. Well, since uh, we haven't got anything in the lobby yet, I'm going to start off with a question we got from Sean P. Kelly last week that we All talked right. about bumping to this week for the AMA. So we, uh, we've chatted about Kickstarter many a time on this show. We've even done full Kickstarter episodes, mm -hmm. but... What on Kickstarter right now has you excited? All right. So we talked about this during the coffee break. So the number one game for me that's being kickstarted right now isn't even on Kickstarter as far as I'm concerned. It is on Hasbro Pulse, which is Hasbro's own internal crowdfunding, whatever the heck. I don't think it's actually crowdfunding at all, to be honest. I think it's Kickstarter's way to set up a pre-order system. Because uh, I'm pretty sure there's nothing that doesn't ever get funded there. Like, I think it's just their way of building up hype. And that is the new edition of a classic, which is Hero Quest. Which I don't know if people on the stream can see, but my copies are up there behind me. Um, just above my head there. Hero Quest was a game that, unlike many people who are like, oh, I played that growing up. Well, I, I, was, I was pretty grown up by the time I was playing Hero Quest. It was a game that actually I played with Deanna when we were dating. We actually played through the entire campaign together. So that's always had a special place in my heart due to that. Plus, I love the game. It was based on the Warhammer universe, and I was a big fan of the Warhammer universe. And it was such a simple system. And it was a game that was easily expanded. And it was one of the things that got me into dungeon mastering fantasy style games games is making my own hero quest scenarios so hero quest on hasbro pulse yes i realize i'm cheating because it's not on kickstarter but is is my number one now i guess saying that my kids have probably worked with deanna and there may be a copy of that coming at christmas well it won't be coming at christmas it won't be funded but i'll probably get notification that something was funded there but that is probably the one and i don't know i gotta admit i debated it it is a lot of money when the project first launched, they were doing ridiculous things for Canadian shipping. They thankfully fixed that now. I think it's only 30 bucks for the whole thing now, but they were going to charge more than the game for shipping. And I don't know, like they are literally reprinting the game with a new set of artwork. And I got to admit, part of me wishes Restoration Games would have gotten the license. And what's weird is Restoration Games registered a trademark for Hero Quest. So I don't know if maybe something else was happening or where what happened there or maybe that's why hasbro's rushing this out is to assert their ip ownership i don't know but i kind of would have liked the modernization but then there's enough nostalgia for the original and i had fun with it that it part of me is also like nah you know what that's better than ruining it i would rather have what i played before improved slightly than a brand new game i don't actually enjoy so i i was on the fence for a while about buying it myself and then i decided to sit back and like you know what this would make a great christmas gift this i'm hard to shop for i know i'm hard to shop for so if you guys want to do that do that that'd be cool and if i don't get it i'm not gonna be that upset either yeah no that's absolutely valid and i think everyone had hoped that that was going to come out on kickstarter uh through restoration games mm. um but licenses do what licenses do uh i've got two active games backed on kickstarter well yep. two and a half three uh <laughs> studies in sorcery caught my eye yep. um i know the marketing the marketing hook of it pushed me a little bit 
Uh, it's not a fancy game. It's not a big game, but it's a solid card based game. And again, I'm, I'm a sucker for card based games for sure. Uh, and then on top of that, I did fall into the trap and, uh, and did give them my money and I'm not going to be upset is, uh, the hoop gods and the second printing of, Rap Oh, you gods. did do it. Nice. I did end up, uh, I was actually one of the ones who helped push them into their first day, um, Nice at the, at the, at the, you know, 11th hour, 59th minute, help push them over their, uh, their target, their target for that first day. Um, and they they've already gotten a couple of stretch goals on that. So that's wow. great. All right, another one I'm tempted by because I don't know if Sean specified gaming Kickstarters or not. I not don't even. know if he did, but just in case he did, no, I think he just said what's on Kickstarter right now. Simon Stallenhog, the man who invented mm-hmm. Tales from the Loop, has the Labyrinth. This is his newest art book, and I didn't even realize it that he became famous because of Kickstarter. The original Tales from the Loop art oh. book that spawned the TV series, the role playing game, and four other books and like a, a novels and comic books are coming and everything else was originally a Kickstarter. The, this artist was unknown before launching Tales from the Loop, the original on Kickstarter, and he's doing his new one called The Labyrinth, which definitely seems to, again, be progressing the storyline with older people. So that seems to be a progression. So Tales of the Loop was kids. Things from the Flood was uh, like teenagers, high school, whereas every stuff for the, uh, the Labyrinth looks uh, a little more aged. Okay. And it looks fantastic. I, I This is one of those, if I had spare cash, to spend on art books, this would be one I would buy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I don't have anything else really that I'm going for. I know actually uh, the giveaway we're doing from uh, uh, the folks at um, Half, Monster. Half Monster have just started a new one. I did take a look at it. It is interesting. It is a superhero based card game. Um, and I, I I hovered my finger over the button for a long time. Uh, yeah. It's it's interesting. It's really cool. Um, honestly, I... I'm sad to say this. Uh, I'm picky enough now that the art was what drove me away. Wow. Um, it's it's an interesting game, but the mechanics alone aren't enough. If it had something better in the way of art on it, I probably would have div- uh, d- uh, dove on it. Um, but I could do those mechanics myself somewhere. Like it's not. Mm-hmm. It's it's uh, it's very much um, uh, and uh, a, a game like the. Um, you're, you're making up a story with cards, basically. Okay. So you, you you generate a superhero with superpowers and a, uh, a victim who needs saving, and you do a sort okay. of story based off of that. But it's really kind of simplistic art. And not not in a great stylized simplicity, just kind of yep. simplistic. And I ended up not... Isn't this like, like Trust Me, I'm a Superhero or something? Yeah, that's What's the one. It? Yeah, Trust Me, I'm yeah, a Superhero. Yeah, Trust Me, I'm a Superhero. Yeah, which is actually a re-theme of an earlier game they made called Trust Me, I'm a Doctor. Yep. So this looks um, have less questionable content. We'll just say. Well, they do have two uh, expansions. There is a, an option you can get the the base game plus two expansions. One okay. of which is silly heroes, and the other one is sexy heroes. Yeah, see. So they have that option in there. I don't know. There, there was there was stuff with like experimenting on children and the not, no, other no, one, and I was like, no, sorry, no, that's not okay. And plague doctor stuff, like like nasty things people did to each other back in the medieval times no, that I don't yeah. think it should be part of levity, in my opinion. But to each their own. Yep. One I thought you might be interested in is Urban Shadow Second Edition, as far as RPGs that just launched. It was either today or yesterday. Oh, see, I've been off uh, Twitter for a couple of days, so ah, no, this one just launched is a big deal. It's Magpie Games. Urban Shadows is considered one of the best. Um, what do you call it? Urban fantasy RPGs oh, out there. Oh, and they did well. Is... Oh yeah, they're wow. they're doing fantastically well. Interesting. I will definitely. This, this is the one exploding in my inbox, right? Because I, I don't know if people realize this, but on Kickstarter, if you haven't used it before, you can follow people, and then you can see everything they back. And well, you know what? Every few minutes, I actually <laughs> get a notification saying someone's back Urban Shadows Second Edition. Right. Now, me, I'm I'm on the fence. I I am. I like some urban fantasy and some I don't. So yeah, it, it it's, it's kinda... if if we if it can recreate the novels of Charles Delint, I want to play it. But this looks <laughs> like it's going more for a Harry Dresden. It's not that I hate Dresden, but yeah. I prefer more of a, a Fey are real and you know giants exist, but people can't see them to gritty noir solving mysteries. Well, they've uh, they've unlocked just about everything. They've only yes. got two more stretch goals to go. Um, that's, that is tempting and it's not yeah. a bad price for the, uh, for the deluxe. 
No, I um, thought I thought it was very reasonable. I thought you might be tempted by this yeah, one if you had if you had seen I'm definitely it. Already. Gonna, I'm definitely going to take a look at that. Um, I'll have to watch uh, again. I'm I'm not a big fan of digital edition. I love my I love paper. my books. I love yep. paper books. If I'm nope. going to run an RPG, even if I'm going to run an RPG online, I still want to have sat there and read the book uh, nope, and held it. the book and you know gone outside and sat in the back patio with with a book in my hands. Um, so. So that's that's a big thing for me. I, I'm I've got a few RPGs that I've got in digital format, oh, yeah. and I look through them, and I just I don't get inspired the same way I do with a book. Now that being said, I did back uh, roll the digital yeah, online system, uh, and I haven't checked in lately. I, I do have an early access uh, to it. Um, okay. And actually, I should bring you into something just so we can both take a look at it and be aware of it. Um, it's still very basic, but they are rolling out more to it bit by bit. Uh, and it looks to be a solid, uh, you know, contender up against places like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20. Mm -hmm. And it's aimed more at the storytelling uh, crowd as opposed right. to the D&D 5th Ed or, uh, you know, yep, ACC yep. crowd. All right. Speaking of the, sor the, the storytelling crowd, I do have to bring up one that most of my Twitter is going nuts for. And that is Thirsty Sword Lesbians. Yes. Cross swords and fall in love with this tabletop RPG by K April Kit Walsh, celebrating queer love and power, powered by the apocalypse, sword fighting lesbians. Yep. That, yeah. I got to say, that's one I want to back just to support. I don't know if it'd be my game or something I'd ever want to play, but this just, to me, is something that I think is fantastic. It looks amazing. The artwork looks great. The layout looks fantastic. Everything about this game looks fantastic. I just don't know if it's the kind of story I want to play in. But I'm. This is one that again, if I had the spare money just to support other people, I've been tempted to do that. I'm like, I'm gonna set up a Patreon where people give me money just to support other people's Patreon, so I can take the time to find who to support. I'm like, here, I'll, I'll take good care of your money. I'll give it to the right people, and that's that's thirsty sword lesbians is one I would definitely support in that case. And interestingly, uh, the digital, uh, or the the cyber flirt on uh, thirsty lesbians, thirty dollars gets you all the digital documents, including the Roll20 campaign module. So yep. for those all digital gamers, they've, they've thought about you in advance uh, and you are good to go right there, which is nice. And then just a couple of quick honorable mentions. Um, one I am most curious about, but I wouldn't back myself is Frostpunk. This is a very impressive looking board game, but I worry about its ability to deliver. And it's the first created by Glass Cannon Games. It's an overly produced. You can tell that, that someone saw Dark Tower was coming out because there's a tower in the middle of the board and there's 3D scenery. And this one, I, I'm going to wait. I want to wait for reviews and I want to wait and see if it's $20 on Amazon six months after it kickstarts or if this becomes the next, you know, um, Gloomhaven that gets a second printing through Kickstarter. It's not one I'm willing to take the chance on, but I got to say it looks pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And there's there's a lot of I mean, well, there's always a lot of games on board on on Kickstarter. Yeah. Um and there are a lot of seriously questionable games on Kickstarter oh, yeah. these days. Um, always. Uh it's interesting. I I I shared something with Mo the other day. I got alerted to a accidental start of a Kickstarter project. That had uh, they'd accidentally hit their launch button before they planned to, and while the art on the cards actually looked really solid, uh, it was okay. well laid out. Yep. The iconography was nice. Everything else about the Kickstarter page sent up giant red flags. Um, it was, I mean, they were just like they, it was a red flag. They, yeah. the, the whole thing should have just been a waving red flag. It was, yeah. it was kind of horrifying, and 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 they couldn't have gotten my money because of the way the Kickstarter page was laid out. Now. We know they launched early. Maybe someone whose English was not their first language had set up the rough page and the editor was going to go in. I hope so. <laughs> but uh, as it was, when it, when it did that pre-launch, it kind of scared yeah. me off them completely. Uh, Just jumping back to our lobby right now. So Jeff's a little salty about Urban Shadows, and I totally get it. Has the first edition, hasn't played it yet. That always sours me on a game that has happened to me a number of times, even with board games, miniature games. I can't believe every time. If, if anyone out there wants a new edition of War Machine to come out, just let me know, because I'll decide to get into the game and go buy a unit. And then within a week, they'll go down to a new edition. I'll buy the core rule book. It'll show up. I'll start reading it. And then I will see the news within a week, within seven days. It has happened twice so far within a week of deciding. That's it. 
my friends are playing this game. I'm going to play this game. I'm going to buy it. You can see those. Those are over my shoulder too. You can see a Menoth army box right back there. That was the last time when I bought that. That's when Prime Mark II went away and the newest edition came out. And I get it. I totally understand getting like, oh, why are you doing a new edition? Now, from what I understand from Urban Shadows, from, from the indie RPG scene, is that it was one of those, it just barely made it the first time. Like it, it kickstarted, it did pretty good and it has fans, but now it has lots of fans. And now is their chance to turn it into what it should have been in the first place. And I kind of get it. Plus it's indie support, indie developers, any indie developer don't have a regular infusion of cash. So I don't mind supporting them again. Like um, for example, there's a new edition of Ironetta coming out. That'll be the third, but I think that's fantastic. And I'm more than willing to support Ironetta yet again. It seems like they're doing a lot of fixes to it and sound, things that sound awesome. And the second edition sounded better than the first edition. So, yeah. And, and to be fair, I mean, those are games, especially, you know, Ironetta, uh, as much as we support their work, they haven't sold a lot of copies. Exactly. So, yes, yeah. while some people may be a little bit upset, the majority of us are just really happy to see it get into more hands so that mm -hmm. there are more people we can play it with. Yeah, exactly. Now, I don't know. Like, there might be something with Urban Shadows. We can get a hold of them and get an upgrade kit or something like that. I didn't dive into it. It was just a game that I know Sean's been kind of going nuts on the RPG Kickstarters lately. And I thought it was one that would catch his interest. Now, another one I want to give a shout out to is Freedom 5. Couple things this is doing. For one, it's based on the highly popular Sentinels of the Multiverse Universe, which I still want that RPG. This is a cooperative comic book board game. And what they have done, which I haven't seen on Kickstarter yet, is there are a couple different things. Custom meeples, but pre-painted miniatures. And I'm like, wow. So not only am I going to have like these things, the pictures I'm seeing of them look like Disney Infinity or, or um, the Spyro stuff you can buy. And I'm like, wow, that is an option is to get it. I got to admit, it's expensive. It's double the price of the, the original game. If you want the Sentinel edition with the pre-painted figures, you're, you're going to pay for it. Or maybe that's even the limited edition. Where is the one that gives you the, the pre-painted figures? But I'm like, that is really cool. The other thing that's really impressive is Arcane Wonders is putting this out. Now, everything Sentinel Comics in the past was like small little indie company. Oh, I'm drawing a blank on who used to produce it. It's not indie boards and cards. Now I'm drawing a blank on who used to produce Sentinel Comics. So I don't know what happened there, like with the license changing or anything yeah. else. But like they have heroic scale miniatures, they're 6.3 millimeters tall. Plus, I love the Sentinel Comics universe. The game looks interesting. It looks well done. No, it's not the next Marvel, right? It's not going to do as good as a Marvel game or a DC game, but there are fans of the series out there. Plus, I enjoy playing unlicensed superhero stuff now and then too. So again, this is an honorable mention. This is one I'm going to wait till it's out. It's a brand new system. We'll see how it does. Maybe it's something I'll pick up once it's, uh, once it's out on the market, but it's one I'm definitely going to be watching. Excellent. And then we're going to leave off with a light one that just looks neat because I like dexterity games way more than I probably should for being what I'd normally call a heavy gamer. I just, I don't know. I have a thing for dexterity games, things I get to touch and feel. And that is Kabuto Sumo. This just looks fascinating. It's you're putting these discs onto this like lily pad and you're trying to get ones to fall off. And it kind of reminds me of the, the ticket machine where you drop the coins in and it pushes other coins off. It, it's kind of using that mechanism. Game's only 30 bucks. It just looks neat. Uh, the, the art style is really cool. I don't know. something about this game. Like I see it and I'm like, I want that game. That just looks cool. I want to have this game. Yeah. they And they, I mean, they had a solid marketing push too. Like when that yeah. dropped, um they there were waves of that game coming out <laughs> yes just, just washing over twitter so uh that was definitely a solid one all right that's it from me for kickstarter yeah i haven't got i mean i'm waiting on some stuff i've got some stuff in the pipeline but uh i don't want to necessarily shut out that because well you guys can't get that because it's all it's already closed and working on fulfillment and stuff like worldwide wrestling and galaxy in peril yeah yeah the latest edition of worldwide wrestling from nathan d paylet i am looking forward to that uh, that game is so much fun. I, that is just such a good game. And then what's another one is um, I, I am still waiting for Anachrony. Anachrony, I don't know if it's COVID hit it or what, but that is one of the most delayed Kickstarters I've had in recent memory. Like in the past, having a Kickstarter be three years late it used to happen a little more often. <laughs> now I'm a little more discerning in what I back and people tend to get their stuff out late usually, but not that late. That one's taking its time. 
And to be honest, I want to look. What else am I backing? I don't think well, I Garinto. have anything else. <laughs> well, Garento, yes. Yeah, we, we are coming. aware of that one's not behind yet. That wasn't supposed to come out till next year. No, no, so. he's he's looking. He's they're they're sounding good in time. I know one of the problems that's really been happening. Um, I've got some of my technology ba- uh, projects that I'm backing. Uh, are running late on delivery because they can't get into the factories yeah. to look at the prototypes. Um, like they just, they, they can't look at their prototypes because they can't get into mm-hmm. a factory in China. Um, even if they can get to China, they can't get into the factory. Yeah, they can't get stuff. in. Um, so uh, there's stuff like that that's going on. And I mean, prototype, you, you've got manufacturing issues with games too. So if you, if you might've been planning to fly over to China and inspect all your pieces before manufacturing, mm-hmm. Now you've got to get it put on a slow boat, shift over to North America where you can inspect it, tell them it's wrong, send it and back. And then if it's wrong, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. not a fun uh, product production cycle in that case. Yeah. So Anacrity was due out in March this year. So that that's it's not a year behind yet, but I think it's going to hit there. Uh, Worldwide Wrestling, I am still waiting on. And that's it for stuff I back. Now, yes, there are like um, the new, um, oh, what's it called? I'm drawing a minute blank. Valeria game. Like yes. that, I should be getting a production copy. There's some stuff that we did Kickstarter previews for that the publishers are supposed to be providing us with official copies once they come out, and then we'll do a review of the, the full production version. But I don't have, this is the problem with that, I don't have a way to track those. Right. And I was telling Deanna that what I should start doing, plus it shows some support, is backing all of those at a buck. Right. And then making a note, so at least I see the updates and stuff, because like I honestly have no idea what's going on with Garinto. Like, I well, know it's coming. See, see Garinto, I do know, because I did that with. I yeah, backed you them. backed that one. I backed yeah. them for some bucks. I wasn't going to get the game because it's not something that's going to get played here. Uh, yeah. But you are getting a copy, and I just wanted to give them support because I yep. really love the game. No, that's fully fair. That's such a good game. So how are we doing? We we killed a, We talked a ton about Kickstarter. See, that's what I want to do. I want to deep dive a topic like that. Does anyone in the chat room, we we got 11 people in there. Come on, someone must have a gaming question. Uh, did I need to narrow it down again? Because last week we narrowed it down, and I want I want questions about transitions. How about, I don't know. Well, we do have, transitions questions. About the we time do have questions that came in early on Discord today. Yeah, it's true. Plus, uh, one of the people who asked the questions is actually in the chat room. So absolutely. I don't think we have to repeat, have him ask again when we have a recording. Right. I'm used to having Jeff's questions in my back pocket without Jeff actually being present, so... <laughs> Well, I was actually going to go with Math Guy Dave's question from okay. earlier today. So what are the games that are at the top of your list to play once it's safe to play in public again? Like, what are, you know, we know you've got some, uh, some family gaming going on. You've got you know, four adults who can play uh, occasionally. But uh, you know, what are those bigger, names you, the bigger games that you might want to get out there that you just can't do right now? Well, the biggest one, which isn't really a play in public, so I want to get back to playing Gloomhaven with Cory and Kat. That's not playing in public. That's playing in my basement. But that's the one I think we miss the most. I we really enjoy hanging with Tori and Cat, meeting up early, going for dinner sometimes, meeting up on the weekend, uh, heading out to like the Sandwich Brew Pub, have a couple drinks and some um, some charcuterie, and then heading back here and playing some games. And then our weekly Gloomhaven games. Those are the big ones. Uh, the other, I don't know, like. I, you know what? I just don't have anything off the top of my head, but I know if I look at our review games, there's like stuff we've reviewed that I know will be better with more players that we kept talking about. Um, CO2, I want to play with more people, but I'm not like in a rush to play that. Right. Um, trying to think, what have we reviewed recently? <laughs> that, I'm so like, many. I know there's stuff. I'm just like drawing a blank right now. Well, I mean, some of it would be uh, RPGs, right? You, well, yes. You know, we, don't, we aren't online RPGers. Uh, so getting those RPGs played is is tough. Uh, when you don't have that digital group already yeah. uh, set or easily set, but we did we did do that one game we online. Did, we it had, worked we pretty had well. Game. Yep, it, and we probably should do it again. Yep. For some reason, I, I I find it easier to dedicate my time to a physical game. Right. Whereas when I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Sometime <laughs> we should play some games some online somewhere with some people. I don't know when. Uh, um. Why, why? Like I, I just I feel like I'm mental blind. This is bad for an AMA. I can't remember names of games. What else have we talked about recently? Like the the escape room games are not. Those are actually better two player. Um, this is bad. I feel bad. I should, you know what? You even had this in the notes earlier, and I didn't read. I didn't cheat and read ahead of time, and like prep any of this, which is I think obvious right now. Um, in general, it's just know what I miss. I miss playing a bunch of different games. Right. Like it's it's not a specific game. What I miss 
is going to easy mode or CG realm or a coffee shop or wherever or, uh, any local event may be and bringing a milk crate with six or seven different games and sitting down and like judging the crowd and deciding when to pl what to play based on the crowd. And, and one of the big things I miss is having other people there who are excited to play something. So I would have came out, like, say we were going this weekend. I probably trying to think what would I want to show off that we played the most. I can't show off Scooby-Doo because it's just, I, that's what I want to show off. It's <laughs> like, here, I'll show you how Scooby-Doo works. We'll do a demo night and play through the first puzzle. Um, but like, hey, here, Coimbra. So Coimbra, D and I played and we're like, man, this is good. But I can tell it will be better with more players. So I bring Coimbra to play and I grab the Robotech Force of Arms just to play it with someone other than Deanna because I want to review it to play it with some different people and be like, hey, cool, Robotech game with cool art. Sit down and play that, but then bring a copy of Imhotep and Horrified because it's this time of year, right? Like you got to bring, if I was hosting any game event for the next, this last month, I'd be bringing Horrified with me. And then a copy of Go Cuckoo in case Tech or Kevin shows up because he still hasn't had a chance to play Go Cuckoo. And then when we get there, have someone else show up and say, hey, did you bring Terraforming Mars and sit down and play that? Like, I just missed that five hours of dedicated gaming and switching what we play and getting in three or five games, depending on how long they are. And I think that's what I miss the most is that variety. It's like when we do our week in review now, it's like, yeah, I played the two games we were going to review because I needed to play them so we can review them. And that's kind of all we're doing right now. We're not getting in a lot of extra stuff. Nyctophobia. There's there one. we go. I want to play Nyctophobia in public with other people. Not that my extended family was bad, but that's one I want to show off. I want to play that. And I want to play. I want to wear the dark out glasses and do the spooky thing. That's an example of one of the ones. And Eclipse, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxy. I've got this massive box I spent way too much money on that just, we tried it two player and like, nah. And that's, one, game and, with and that's one I'd love to be down there and, and yeah. you know, get in on. So there, I knew they were there. I knew they were in my head somewhere. Eclipse is the biggest. Eclipse, there. We're going to take back everything I said, unwind it, pull it all back in and say, no, Eclipse second dawn for the galaxy with, a, I think it plays six, it plays six or eight players. I can't remember now. Whatever the max player count is, give us 12 hours to do it. It shouldn't <laughs> take that long. It's not Twilight Imperium, but it might take us eight the first time. You know, have, have like, I don't know, the, unfortunately they're gone now. I was going to say, and have like the Windsor Sandwich Shop there so I can get a Coney Dog part way through and take a break. Yep. Yeah, no, Eclipse Second Dawn for the Galaxies up there. Um, the other 4X game that I have to review that I can't review because it's just not the kind of game that my mother-in-law is going to dive into, um, Burning Suns, right. which is something I have from Emil Larson that I interviewed back when he first kickstarted the game. That's another one. Um, I probably would have brought out Flick Wars, I think, is another one. That's a, that's a get. I want to play a six player game of Flick Wars with lots of stuff going on the map with lots of lots of scenery going on. Well, and on that big on the big three by three table. At, yes. Uh, <laughs> Assuming you can lift that mat up. I think you can. Yeah. Because that's a big thing for Flick Wars is stuff, shoving stuff under the mat is right. what makes it so awesome. So yes, there, there, I found my actual answer, but even yeah. like Rituki, like Rituki is a party game. I want to be at easy mode with a, a pint of Walkerville stout and, you know, with uh, Roger sitting there and, and some gamers we never met before who came in to play Mario Kart, but we're like, Oh, what's going on and sit down and play something like that. And uh, Jeff's pointing out, he wants to get it, get that unmatched with uh, people who don't live in his house. And yeah, see, I want to try on that. That's the other thing. Uh, if I was, if I, I'd love to get down there and play, uh, play a game with you because again, I've watched it played, but I've never actually uh, gotten a chance to. So, and, and that's the other aspect of it too is getting to play games I don't have. Right now, my game collection is has gotten become just the pile of obligation. Right, yeah. like yeah, I have some pile of shame stuff downstairs from before, but like I haven't been acquiring new games or trying new games. Right, so I would love to get experience something new right so for example marvel crisis protocol i know people locally are playing that game that's that's the new fantasy flight um living card game based on the marvel universe and people are going nuts for this i don't really like living card games so i'm not going to go buy that but this might be the one for me this might be my new magic but i don't know that so i need to see someone else playing it or the new my marvel crisis protocol i think it is the miniature game there is a lot of games of that going on over at Solon's place at Tabletop Renaissance. And I don't know who this local painter is, but he's got someone painting all his miniatures. Oh my God, do they look good. And I'm like, not a huge Marvel fan, but I'm a huge superhero fan. Like, I, I don't care. Like, I guess I prefer Marvel to DC, but I'm like playing, a, like, I would love to see a good superhero miniature game. Like, cause I haven't seen one yet. I played a couple superhero miniature games and they were so, so. 
I would love to try that one. And while maybe Tolan could convince me to um, upgrade my X-Wing ships and play second edition too, if that was going on. So yeah, Eclipse. Eclipse is the big one. That That is the one. Like I kickstarted that. I spent a lot of money on that. And when Anacrity comes up, I'm going to feel the same way. Like it hasn't shown up yet, but that's going to be another huge box Kickstarter game that's good with lots of people. Right. Are you getting um, Builders of Blankenbrill, Fields and Flocks? I we re, we previewed it yeah <laughs> I, I don't i don't remember if there was an agreement there to get the finished copy when the game came out i i honestly do not remember what our agreement was i'd have to look that up i just realized that. i that was one because i had i had back i had thrown a little bit of money at the failed one uh yeah. and then i and then they restarted it and i didn't uh i didn't yeah to be honest i i didn't don't know if i caught when they restarted it oh, okay. that's a neat game builders of blanca there's a hidden gem builders of blankenberg Fields of Flocks was okay. It was it was an interesting enough addition. Yep. All righty. Uh, All right. I think that that's two nice, good, solid ones. All right. So we got uh, a. Uh, uh, we're going to relate back to that first one a little bit with uh, okay, a question no from Pennywise. Uh, what did you think of GameFound? I the best thing about GameFound is that Kickstarter has a competitor. That, to me, is the most important thing GameFound has done. It's become a viable alternative to Kickstarter, which I think is strongly needed. To Just, just for in the idea of, of uh, what free market ship, I don't know, what, whatever you want to call it, free market economy. Like, I, I don't want Kickstarter to have a monopoly, and I am glad that more people are using it. Because I got to say, the other, I can't even remember the other one. There was another, Indiegogo. Right. Seems to have kind of like no one seems to be using that one anymore. Indiegogo seems to be the site you go to when Kickstarter bans your project or when you fail <laughs> on Kickstarter. So you try there or to scam people. Cause the thing on Indiegogo you can do is you can say, I take the money, even if it doesn't fund, right. which to me just, I don't know. That seems that nah, I would never back any project that says that right. unless it's like, you know, support this small kid to buy a trumpet for their band and learn how to play music or something. But as far as games are concerned, I, like to me, that's a donation. You're not investing in anything at that point. Yeah, and and from the just a, a quick look at Indiegogo's uh, front page, they are very technologically oriented. Not the Kickstarter. Now, isn't. yeah, see that's changed. Um, but but everything on uh, the 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 front page and their their what's cool and and top lists seems to be techno oriented. Okay. So I'm not even seeing. Uh, oh, there are some. Yeah, there is a. Okay, so tabletop games. What do they have for tabletop games? Um, there is there. I mean, there is there are tabletop games there, but uh, not not yeah. Escape room in a box, puzzles, some uh, some app driven uh, board games. Yeah, there's there's yeah. stuff there, but there's not, stuff not tons. Like some of the big ones, like like the the um, Hellboy role playing game and the Hellboy the board game were both funded through GameFound. GameFound to me looks legit. Like it looks like a good site it's just games it's way better to find interesting stuff like there's tags you can look at strategy games or deduction games or adventure games or just game components because these people are crowdfunding components there are actual games getting funded from what i understand it's more it's less north american centric than kickstarter okay so it's better for other countries like you're seeing french versions of games getting put out i like i said to me i haven't used it i have no opinion on I, I haven't researched what it costs to launch a project on GameFound if they charge more or less than Kickstarter. I have to assume less because Kickstarter charges a fortune, but maybe they charge more because it's a focused market. Right. I don't, I, it just, like I said, the biggest thing is it's a competitor. It's another source. It's not Kickstarter has all the eggs in their basket and it's not owned by Hasbro like uh, pulse, right? It's, it's not owned by a huge conglomerate, corporation that has millions of dollars and gets to decide which games are published and which aren't right it's still very independent and i appreciate that aspect of so it. game founder says that they are a free pledge manager so i'm not sure what there's god they must what their take monetization something. is but uh yeah there must be be something but uh build four board something. gamers by board. i have to admit i had never heard of game found oh okay that's actually this is tonight is the first i've ever seen there you it. go so uh something thank you new. for thank you for bringing that up pennywise and uh it's new something else to be on my list i guess i've just never gotten caught up in a wave of, of advertising for that uh yeah that big games from them were nemesis which is uh an aliens board game 
Um, the other thing too is it does seem to be much more board game focused. Well, it's by whereas, by for by game by board gamers for board gamers. Is how yeah, it's board described. game like there are RPGs on it, but you definitely get more of the. And you, you're not going to find um, a thirsty sword lesbians on Game Pound. It's just right. not the kind of thing. Now, what I also really like is itch.io for for you want to talk indie RPGs. Oh, I think yeah, itch.io is more important, bigger, and and the biggest thing since the Forge. And I think is going to surpass. Uh, well, the problem is it's still niche. Yep. Once people more people learn about it, I think it's going to blow up to be bigger than Kickstarter for yep. indie RPGs. Yep. The thing is, Kickstarter still got the numbers, right? So what you do is you create your game on itch.io right now. So you do your ash can and all the steps to get it done and then you kickstart it to get the marketing yeah absolutely. seems to be the best way to put out an indie rpg nowadays yeah and the best thing is it's something we've talked about many times on the show is itch.io lets you fail first it lets you fail forward yeah. it lets you figure out that your game doesn't work before jumping to kickstarter Right. And there's also a real community there. So yes. there are discussion groups and things within the community to to have chats, uh, chats about things. So, again, it's an alternative to in some ways to Facebook, where you might mm. not want to be getting into a Facebook group of designers who, yep. in many cases, may just be there to try and promote their own stuff. Or you're in one where they're enforcing so many rules to try and prevent this, that and the other thing. Itch.io is a little bit more of a free creator space yes. uh, for that sort of thing. Which was very much designed for again, like musicians, right? Like it, it and and video games. Yeah, it, it's video games, especially indie video games. But the RPG community there is just exploded in a way, because it's also now becoming an alternative to things like um, indie press revolution and drive through RPG, because they take less money. Right. So like drive through again has the numbers, it has the people on it, because everyone knows that's the place you go for PDFs and now print on demand but it just doesn't charge as much. Yep. And I don't even know how, I, again, I haven't done it. I don't have any games there. I yet have yet to actually try to sell any of my games. So one of these days just dive into it, but that's another one of those things that takes time. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely something new. And I mean, part of the problem is again, these services are newer. Uh, and so while right now they are charging less and, and, and taking less for yes. what they give uh, at some point, monetization <sighs> issues generally mm -hmm. arise and people need to pay the bills. So, and to we'll, be honest, it's one of those things where someone will probably buy itch.io. Yeah, more That's than likely, what'll probably happen. Uh, if At we're if we'll be lucky, might it might be someone. Well, if we're if you're really lucky, it might be someone like Drive Through RPG who bought it and kept it as the indie as, wing of. Well, yeah. Drive to be RPG. honest, that's what happened because there used to be Drive Through RPG and there was RPG Now, right. and they were separate companies. And then one bookshelf. And I don't know if it was a merger or someone bought someone out. I don't know all the background there. That sounds like a, a bad 10 car chat to me. Is <laughs> I'm sure there's a story behind it. But um, there was definitely two separate PDF companies out there. And they, they have amalgamated somehow. Coco uh, Pelli. Coco Pelli is the latest Stefan Feld. So I'm excited about it because it's a Stefan Feld. That's interesting because um, I Google Coco Pelli and I get either a fertility deity or a bull. So uh, <laughs> well, uh, I'm sure it's about the fertility deity. Uh, that was that's just recently announced. What I am actually really kind of excited about, and I really hope Travis at Queen Games comes through for us, is the City series that was kickstarted. I don't think that's still on Kickstarter because I didn't back it. But that is a series of four Stefan Feld games, which are rethemes and remashings of his original games being redone. So there's a newer version of Bruges coming out and so on based on different cities. And I'm really looking forward to that. Those, I, it, I, <laughs> to be honest, if I'm not able to get uh, uh, review copies, I'm looking forward to the Queen Games garage sale or yard sale that ends up on Amazon eventually, because I don't know what it is with Queen Games and their pricing on Amazon, but their games end up cheap eventually. So, but yeah, Stefan Feld, any new Stefan Feld games, I don't... Uh, I, I get excited about because it's a Stefan Feld game. Though I'm behind. I have not kept up with the latest Feld releases even close. I haven't I haven't even seen Nova Luna except for a couple people playing it on uh, Tabletop Simulator during one of the online conventions. Right. All right. We got anything else crowdfunding? We might as well stick to the same topic if we have it. Um, not. I thought I saw something else. We have the C series. Okay, so Coco Pelli was there. I actually yeah. had the chat open for a minute. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, not excited to sign up for one more service. I got to agree that yep. there is that aspect. Of there it. is. So, so Red Meeple Ryan in the chat is saying the problem, in, in a way, the problem with all these different services is having to sign up for all of them and having to keep track of them and, and yet more services. I, you know what? It, that's the toss up, right? Is, is you could have the monopoly that does it well and does it right and it's great. Or you can have the competition, which drives a monopoly to hopefully be better. And you got to kind of balance that, right? Like, I wish there was a competitor for Facebook out there because, man, I hate using that site. But it's the place you have to go because it's where the people are. And it's, it's the only way to get some of your content seen nowadays because so many people use that site. So, you know, I, while I don't necessarily want to sign up for MeWe and YouMe Social and WT Social, I do because I keep hoping that one of them will you know, become the next G plus, to be honest, which of the, like an actual competitor that hopefully the uh, host doesn't give up on. Before yeah. It gets, I, and you know. I mean, honestly, I'd love Google to, to be the next G plus, yeah, but I would, I would also that. be at the same time hesitant to dive into it. Well now, yeah. Because of the Google graveyard. Yeah. So, and Google's done that problem all the time. So I don't know. I like, I get it. I get not wanting to sign up for anything else. To be honest, I am going to go wherever the coolest looking games are, right? Like, and, and the ones that I know, like if all of a sudden Queen Games and Stefan Feld starts using GameFound, I'll probably start buying games on GameFound. I'm, I'm going to chase the stuff more than I'm going to care about the platform. Now, I'm not going to try some brand new site that no one's ever used before. Yeah, but now now these sites are all established, right? Indiegogo, GameFound. Oh, there's you others on MeWe, so I think that was pretty close to. <laughs> oh, MeWe still that of all of the Facebook alternatives, that is the one we get the most interaction on. That that is where we get a lot of our comments. Um, all of the Chris Groff comments, all of the Phil Hatfield comments, all of um, there's four or five Keith Davies. There's about s- names that come up often on our show, right? Where people interact with this actually happens on me. So because what happens solid is, engagement there. Yeah. Yeah. We get solid engagement there. That's where a lot of the gamers from PG plus went. The problem is they, when they first launched had some, they were a little too willing to allow things on their site that people didn't want them to allow on their site. They were, they were trying to be an open impartial, and impartial community. But when you do that in the current state of the world, you get, groups that just shouldn't exist period yep. online or otherwise yeah without diving too much into the political yes they were fence sitters and some people were not willing to go on to a site and support a site that were fence sitters yep. and to be honest i don't know if they still feel that way i haven't kept track i i don't know if that's still a problem we've got our little group we do our little thing and it's not that little it's it's a significant group there's there's one group that's thirty eight thousand gamers in it so like right. it's not tiny but it's not facebook yeah yeah yeah, you don't have four billion people to to fit to you know pick from. No, I do. I me we me we is the best G plus alternative out there as long as you are okay with their hands off politics. Right, I think is probably the best way to word it. All right, um, all right. Uh, how long are we going? I haven't been watching the time as much I, as I haven't you have. been as close. We're about an hour, you know, a little under an hour from the start of show from the start so we could probably do one more we'll probably do another uh, another question I, I think we'll do one more what we should do is we should cover jeff's um correction from our last ama absolutely here we go so uh jeff was watching the ama and we got to got to his last ama from uh, september and he got yep. to his question about content uh, about games versus people creating games now the original question was why do you think more people seem to find success making content about games than finding success making games, publishing games, or running game stores. Right, but, where we we kind of went off on a whole... Yeah, we, I don't we, think they are. We picked <laughs> a direction was our and ran took. off. Yeah, we picked yeah, a direction we, and we, ran we, off. So uh, what, what Jeff can see are people making game content on YouTube as a business. Uh, he gets the impression that Tom Vassell, Rotto, the Shut Up and Sit Down people, Mike Mercer, Will Wheaton with Tabletop, and stuff like that are far more financially successful than most game designers or small publishers, people, not companies. Uh, the guy behind designing Pandemic makes a modest full-time living, mm-hmm. but his is one of the most successful games on the market besides Catan. True. Most designers barely make enough to order a pizza a month on royalties is the impre- impression that Jeff gets. Yeah, and I got to say, he's got to be right again. I don't know actual numbers, but they said the one I always saw, we mentioned Steppenfeld like 10 times tonight. So we're going to stick with Steppenfeld. Steppenfeld has a day job. That, that right there tells you almost everything you need to know about getting rich in the board game industry. It doesn't happen, right? You, like, and, and again, 
I don't know know how well Matt Leacock, who designed Pandemic, does. There are game designers out there who have made it, like your, your Friedman Freeze, your Rainer Nitzias. They, they are out there. They do exist. But he's right in a way. But I, the thing is, it's it's a, it's a 1% issue in a way. It's, it's there aren't, the, like Jeff almost mentioned them all with Tom Vassal, Rado, Shut Up and Sit Down. Like that, those are the big producers. I know some of the other people who produce content on YouTube and they don't, like they're not that big. There's, no. um, well, Chaz and, Marler would be another one that should be up even, there. I mean, let's talk about Rado even. You know, Rado yeah. got his start by using, and we're going to loop this back to the earlier topic, Kickstarter. You know, yeah. he went on Kickstarter and said, look, I want to go and I want to go to Spiel. Go I want to buy these games. Yeah. I want to make this a thing and, and quit my day job. So here are some funding things. And, you know, if you fund me at this much, you get to be on the show with me. And if you fund me at this much, I will test your prototype games. Mm -hmm. um, he had gone from a, you know, very much a, a hobbyist who was doing this, mm -hmm. you know, every once in a while for fun to making it a full time job and got people to back like $18,000 for him in order to fund his career. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's still, you know, that's still not really a lot of money when you look no. at a, a, you know, a year's salary or multiple years. Well, salary. That, that would supplement his YouTube income right. and any other income he has. Well, and at the time, I don't think he was making any, any YouTube or any or very little YouTube income um, back well, yeah. in 2014 or 13 or whatever it was that uh, that Kickstarter happened. Mm -hmm. And that, that is actually a fair point because almost, I don't know about Rado or sorry, I don't know about shut up and sit down, but Tom Vassell is funded through a Kickstarter. Yeah. Tom Vassell and, and, runs a Kickstarter yeah. and that's what lets Tom do what he's doing. Now he already did it for years. And the biggest thing that changes now he has employees. So he was able to give his friends, basically saw a couple of his friends, full-time jobs through the Kickstarter, but he was also able to dedicate enough stuff. So they literally we're making videos like unboxing videos that are getting 10,000 views and not making enough to get by. Yeah. So I think there is a misconception in general by most people on how much YouTube pays you. Yeah. The, it really does not pay a lot. Like we're nowhere near Tom Vassell's level or anything like that. And like, yes, you'll see the people sharing the fact they make a thousand dollars a day on YouTube, but those are mainly the people who make videos about how to make a thousand dollars a day on YouTube. And like, seriously, yeah. that's what works. It's, it's the same people who sell PDFs on how to create PDFs. Right. Like it's, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It drives me nuts, but those are the things that get views or the views on um, uh, things that aren't cake. Right. Like uh, we watched a video about that where this Chinese production company produces a YouTube video every day and has won all these gold buttons. And all they do is they repeat the same 12 videos into different videos and they know how to SEO it well. Right. And now Jeff's pointing out, you know, he's not thinking they're getting rich, but are getting full time jobs. And again, I think what we're trying to point out here is, though, it's not really a full time job unless you get bring in income from elsewhere, unless you fight to do right. the Kickstarters for yourself. Right. Whereas a publisher can do a Kickstarter for their next game. Uh, you know, Tom's doing Kickstarters for him, his company, for his for business. Him, yes. For um, the Dice Tower. The, 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 the income from the content creation uh, isn't generally making it. Um, the people who may be making it a full time job uh, are in oftentimes maybe doing questionable things uh, the paid reviews, the, uh, you know, paid previews, the, and, and other, and other things, uh, you know, not properly declaring whether or not you're whether or not you've been paid to yep. do things um there are there are certain issues about that and and ftc uh declarations and things that are going on uh you know people are hiding income and and mm -hmm. things like that so it it becomes a little more tricky i would say no nobody is really making a full-time job out of this uh with uh, you know just out of the content creation without going over and above and yeah. selling some sort of services. There are the rare few, but they're selling services. So an example of this is Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking. Lance Mixter, the Undead Viking, now works for game companies. So he now has a full-time job, but he has it in the game industry. Before that, he did videos. And where he got famous was he was one of the first people to do um, Kickstarter previews, where he would show off the game before it was produced. And I happen to know what he charged for those. And if he's putting out enough videos in a week, he can, you could can live off that. He was living off that. Other content creator that manages to pull it off is Dyson Logos. Dyson Logos manages to not have to have a day job through Patreon by drawing maps. But Dyson Logos is one of the best map drawers on the damn planet. 
there we just got our rating i said damn <laughs> uh our best map drawers on the planet and now he's being hired by wizards of the coast to do maps because right. finally other people have recognized his style but it took him forever to get there so it happens there are the ones that have done it but like the example the fact that tom vassal needs to run a a kickstarter to be able to fund it the secret Girl gaming podcast about five years ago now did the same thing so it was um Jamie, the the head of the Secret Cabal, was doing the podcast as a hobby. And then a lot of people kept asking for more. Like, we love your content. We want more. We want more. And YouTube was starting to pick up and Twitch was becoming a thing. And like, we want more content for you. He's like, well, the only way I can do more content is to quit my job. And this doesn't pay enough to quit my job. And people encouraged him to run a Kickstarter. And it blew up the first year. Like, I actually think he made more the first year than a couple of years later because it was the first time doing it. But that was what let him take it to that next level. Now, I would almost suggest game designers do this, but then Martin Wallace tried. Martin Wallace went and made his own company called Tree Frog Games that was only going to produce Martin Wallace games, and he was going to Kickstarter them all, and it failed. So, I don't know. I, I just think there's less out there. Now, the exception also is, you mentioned Mike Mercer and Will Wheaton. The thing is, they're celebrities. They were celebrities before right. they started gaming online. They were already, I wouldn't say rich, but they were doing well enough and more importantly, had a following already. They had a group of invested people who were willing to give them money to produce more content. And, and I mean, the fact of the matter is, if you are Will Wheaton, then if you make a YouTube channel, you are going to start with, say, 100,000 followers, yes. which is something that most people take years and years and years to build up to. And with 100,000 followers, you're actually starting to see an income. Yes. Um, you know, you know, the guys who are making actual money on YouTube, on, on YouTube and just on YouTube content started about a million followers, um, to yes. make, to make a really solid income. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and the guys who are doing that are, you know, like the YouTube guys, if you look at a Hermitcraft player, which is again, my, you know, my, I've talked about them many times, my, my, my favorite Minecraft, uh, content creators, these guys are putting out two, three videos a week, not including stream content. Those videos are are made by playing the playing Minecraft professionally six to twelve hours a day and editing that content into video and deleting all of the the grindy stuff that nobody mm. wants to watch on YouTube and you know filming things with other other content creators on the server in order to get a you know twenty minute forty minute video twice a week to keep their million followers happy. Uh, and then they have to stream on top of that and they have to tweet on top of that and, and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, you know, pick how there aren't too many games that you're probably willing to pay, play 50 to 60 hours a week. <laughs> yeah. There's none. I'm willing and to that's, play and that's what they're many doing. Hours I mean, a week. The, the guys who are the guys, like the gaming people who are doing this professionally are playing those games, a minimum of 50 to 60 hours a yeah. week. Some of them more. That's the other thing too, that there's a lot of work that goes behind this, even like our, small show compared to <laughs> like to produce those Tom Vassal videos and those Dice Tower videos and the amount yeah. of work that goes into it. I and mean, you get it, it, I, when you break it down into yeah. like I, I, I do it. I do the you know minimum wage in Canada is fifteen bucks an hour. And I, I work out well, D and I are not making fifteen dollars an hour doing this and trust me our money's not coming from YouTube, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah no, well, it, it's, there's, it's there's there's also I mean there's other costs, especially you know for, uh, when you look at a game, you know, a game creator for content and they've got to buy their PC They've got the cop their one copy of the game or two copies of the game that they need. Uh, and then they're good for a year or two until they need they you know, the something else. Whereas, you know, to get this running, we're look we're constantly looking at upgrading microphones, mm -hmm. cameras, lighting setups, sets, uh, new PCs to increase this stream, new mm -hmm. bandwidth to do this. You know, there are a lot of costs. And as you increase, you know, if we move all of our cameras up to 1080p. Soon enough, we're going to be having people ask, wondering, you know, expecting better because everyone else has moved Where's up to 4K, 4K or 12K or whatever else. You know, there are always ways that we can keep upgrading our video content because it's not video content of a game, right? It's not just the game shots. It's mm -hmm. it's us and and the product. So the other, I don't know, to be honest, I think it's actually more similar too. So looking at the both sides of it, right? So you look at the Tom Vassals and you compare those to the, the Martin Wallaces. And I think the thing is, it's the, it's way more work than you think. And you have to be constantly putting out content. And that's how 
game designers are the same thing. Like you put out one game and even if it blows up, you're not getting much off that one game. You put out two games, you're getting a little more. You put out 20 games, assuming some of them become evergreen, right? That's why I'm saying like a Martin Wallace or a Stephen right. Feld, where people are still playing the first game they ever published because it was that good, has that. So that that is is a thing. Whereas the same thing with the content creator, you got to be constantly putting out videos. Now jump into YouTube making money. Sean and I and Deanna have been watching videos that on how to get more views, how to get more subscribers, right? What can we do to get it better? And you watch these and it blows my mind because people are like, well, if my video doesn't get 10,000 views in the first hour, that's a failure. And I delete the video. That was obviously a bad one. 10,000, we don't have all our videos combined. Like, yeah, we weren't been around two years, but like, I have a feeling even if I look at Tom Vassell's, he doesn't have a lot of videos that have 10,000 views, even ones that have been up for a long time. Like it yeah. just, it doesn't happen. We don't have any video. If you add up all our videos together, yes, because we have one extremely well-performing video, we can get to 10,000 views total <laughs> over all our videos. Yeah. But I mean, that's definitely a, a thing, right? Like, yep. like, well, and, and it's like successful, right? 10,000 views in the first hour. And that is all based in this video was all because of his thumbnail. Yep. That's all that changed. It was a picture. It's why did this video work in this one? Not. And it had to do with his thumbnail. Yep. That was it. <laughs> Instagram. Instagram has the same sort of thing. You know, the, the, the big money people on Instagram who are getting the, the sponsorships and whatnot. Uh, you know, if they're, if that gram doesn't pr produce in that, in the first hour, yep. it's going away because yeah, it's, it's not content that, that's working. Yep. So I don't know. It's a thing. I, Jeff may be right overall. I, there may be more successful content creators than designers. I don't know. I like, uh, again, we're, we're, we, I know some of the numbers for some of the people behind the scene. I happen to be in some Facebook groups where things like pricing and money gets discussed. I will say the average cost to do a Kickstarter preview video is $300 US, but that is a video not like we produce. That is a, a video where they spend two weeks filming right. stuff and B rolls and sound effects and special right. effects and cards lighting up and not, like, not like something well, you throw up on you on, on, on Twitch, a, right. a video produced for YouTube. Right. So you are looking at getting paid $300 to create an ad. And I got to say, hey, publishers, what a flipping deal compared to going to an advertising company. Oh, I mean, right? absolutely. I, I like, like think 300 bucks is nothing when you're if, thinking advertising if I, budget. If, if Mo and I were living in the same city, there's a, a possibility we would be doing this sort of stuff yeah. because of my production background and, and Mo's uh, knowledge of, the, of that industry. But the problem is, I don't know how I could do videos for $300. You know, I, right. you know two weeks of your life for 300 bucks. That's... Well, that's it. You got to be doing all the other yeah. stuff at the same time. It, it's <laughs> exactly. a constant hustle, to be honest, to, yeah. to keep it going. It, it's it's a constant hustle. It's it's sad, but that's where it is. And now part of this is people undervaluing the end product. But that is a totally different topic. Maybe we'll save for another AMA because at this point, it, we hit 1030. And if nothing else, I need to take a quick break. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, that's it for this we... month. Well, sorry. Do we have anything in the chat we want to summarize? I saw a whole bunch showing up while we were talking about that. And Jeff, is that close to your question? That's the main thing I'd like to know because we were trying to correct our, our conversation. I think part of that went where we went last time too. But um, yeah, I said, well, I, I, he Ryan's, may be right. Yeah, and Ryan's talking, you know, there's a lot of uh, whether or not you'll make your fortune designing games, lots of prototyping conventions pre-pandemic that are well attended oh, yeah. by those who are wanting. Then that's part of the problem is, I mean, well, there's a million people who want to make content who want to produce stuff and uh, you know, uh, on both sides that the game designers and the content creators uh, like on YouTube, yes. there's a million of us on both sides. More than a million. <laughs> like that, that's just it. Con like we've talked about it before. Right. And I, this year is lower, but for one, for the pandemic and two, there wasn't a bubble that burst, but there's a, there has been the effect that companies can no longer put out 10 games in a year. Uh, Stephen Bonacore, who's now retired, but who, when he worked for stronghold games, has talked about his diminishing returns on games because the market is flooded at that point. It's literally at that point. There is no way there was a point in time when I got into this hobby where I could theoretically play every game that was released near every hobby board game, every designer game, everything by Mayfair, Rio Grande games, Edgar Spiel, all the big companies. I could play them all in a year. I may not want to, but I could, it could physically be done. That is impossible. Nowadays, it is it's three thousand games. There aren't enough hours in the year to try every game that comes out, and then you have all these fish trying to get a piece of the pie, right? Like fish getting a piece of the pie. Where am I? 
Either those fish are interesting, or that pie is. Uh, <laughs> damn, getting a piece uh, of the pie. I don't even know. I don't even know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean, though, right? Like, it's just yeah. there's so many people trying to design games because yeah. the amount and, of and, money for games is not changed, but the the number of people trying to take a bite out of that market. Yeah, is, uh, like, on hey, both it's the number yeah. of people. And, and it's the same thing with the content creator market, right? Like we got into podcasting late. We got into streaming fairly early, but like even since we've gotten to streaming, when you used to go to Twitch, I should try to test this right now. If I go to the board game category, I bet you there's more than three people streaming under board gaming. Absolutely. When we first started podcasting two years ago, you would go to board ga- gaming and you would see four streams, one of them us. Yep. And literally that's it. That's all the people talking about board gaming right now. I don't want to screw up Twitch by opening it, but <laughs> I'm wondering how many are on right now. Usually about 12 to 16. I mean, yeah. under the board like game that's category. just in two years, right? And that happens to be like Wednesday night, late at night, Eastern time, right? Like I'm sure if you go to prime time, it'd be even worse. Yep. Yes. The orc and the pie. Thank you, Jamie. But yeah, in general, I, there, the, a lot of the, a lot of the content creators people think are doing extremely well are, are supporting the, it some other way, us included. I, we've said it many times. I'm not trying to hide the fact Deanna and I, we make our money through affiliate links. We advertise products for gaming companies and mass, big mass market online retailers, and we get a small kickback for every game people buy. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be here right now. Or I, are... I, I'd be just getting off work and showing up and stressed out and have even more gray hair and be like, I don't know. I didn't get a chance to do the notes tonight. So there, I don't there know are 300 about. people watching uh, 18 different board, including us, 18 different board game feeds. Tonight wow, 300 is a, we have a significant piece of that pie. Yeah. Like 300 <laughs> people is not a lot. Nope. So, but that's it, right? It's... Like, like, like Ryan's frustrated by, it. I know he has been because so many people doing shows at this time every week, spread it out. The problem is if we were on Tuesday, you'd be saying the same thing. Cause there'd be other people doing shows. I mean, we moved from Thursday because there were too oh, many, well, critical critters. Role. Uh, the, the critters yeah. were, would, would never watch us on, on Thursdays. So, nope. Um, you know, and we, we have a couple Wednesday. that watch us yep. sometimes. Um, we have been asked to move to Tuesday a couple times now, but I just have a feeling if we move to Tuesday, there'd be people saying, why can't you be on Wednesday? Yeah, it's, it's right. I, like, I honestly don't think we can win on that one, yeah. which is why you can watch this on YouTube at youtube.com slash tabletop. Absolutely. All well, right. At this thing point, I think we've wrapped up everything we got for the AMA. That was a good one. I liked it. We didn't get a lot of live questions, but we had backup questions from people in the chat. Yep. And I love the interaction we got once we started talking. Absolutely. So that's it for this month's AMA. Thank you to everyone who submitted a question. For those, those of you who missed any discussion, you can watch this sec- segment at any time on YouTube. For those <laughs> of you who that uh, we're here live, we'll be going live. Our, for those of you here live, that will be going live on Sunday. Yes. Uh, no, actually, Saturday is when these it's go Saturday up. Saturday now? Saturday is, I don't when even know it. Saturday is when the, the asks go up. And that's uh, a, I'm getting confused. For the rest of you listening on the podcast, this will already be up on YouTube. Uh, and, and we, we don't even stored, know. And we have stored questions from this episode and other episodes that we didn't get to that may get answered on future AMAs. Yes. That, that if no one shows up next week, we'll be all good. <laughs> it's definitely cooler if people are here and we get to interact with you. And I'm glad we were able to clear up things for Jeff. Finally, if you've got a gaming or game night question for us, especially a nice big meaty topic we can dig into on a full podcast episode, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop or just email me directly, questions at tabletopbellhop.com. 